name is Anna Scordi. I am from Cyprus and uh, I'm an actress. So, what is your story you want to uh, well, it happened in uh, 2003 to uh, 2004 when I was 24 and uh, I moved to Athens for a while and um, I was uh, um, I was discovering a new world because my life before was pretty settled in Cyprus. I was working in theater for like three years. I had my flat, I had my car, and everything seemed quite organized. And I felt it was too soon for me to get in this kind of settlement. And I had the need to, to be abroad since I've done my studies in Cyprus. So I, I just found the excuse like I'm going to go to Athens and see what I can do with theater. like make a career or something and I went in Greece and it was a very hard um, uh, journey from the beginning because I had to I was gonna live with my best friend she just went in a relationship and she moved with her boyfriend at that moment so I wasn't I, the plan was to stay there for a while until I find a job and until I find a house. My girlfriend, she was a bit negative with this and I was totally, I felt uh, totally isolated and abandoned. And uh, then a, a whole uh, journey began that was also fascinated because I had to trust my instinct and just, I, I had to keep being positive and catch one thing and then that to learn that one thing leads to another. I knew that theoretically, but I had to practice this. And uh, I found a job. I just, I remember I, we went for coffee on a Sunday in this place. I liked it, very pop art. I loved the colors and everything. So I said, um, I'm looking for a job. Are you looking for somebody? And they said, yes, come. And um, so I got the jobs. I got the job, I met some girls there. And when they heard my story about coming from Cyprus and then that I was in a very dodgy situation living in my friend's house at that moment, it was very tense. I wasn't very welcome. It was strange. And they said, OK, come over and uh, you can stay with us. So I just moved in uh, those girls' house that I was working with, but I wasn't really very familiar with. And um, then I, um, uh, I found a flat. And the owner of this flat was an old man who seemed very kind and very polite in the beginning. And I was, I, I had the need of some safety and some protection. So I thought of him, he was, I think he was almost 80. He was around there. And I felt like, you know, I have a family, my grandfather, something like this. So I go, I see the shitty house. Anyway, that was not important for me at the moment. I had to find a place to live. And this man, like in two or three days, he started uh, um, um, making uh, weird comments. Like he started ha um, talking to me about underwear, about other girls, about the girl that was living in the flat before and that uh, she broke the door when she left. And eventually, after we made the deal and I've given him all my money, all the money I've collected from Cyprus and uh, all the money I was making, um, he started calling me over and over again and asking for meetings somewhere. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and I, this man was actually living very close to the flat I was going to rent. And I also, I was introduced to his wife one day and I realized that I'm gonna get in big, big trouble if I stay there. I mean, this man was very obvious that he had other things in his mind. And uh, one day he gave me around 30 missed calls. And I started freaking out. I was all, also in a, in a bad situation. So I decided that I'm gonna go and tell him, I'm sorry, I, you know, I need my money back. 
something happened, I'm not going to take the flight, I need to leave. So I went, and in the beginning he was very... Uh, he said, no, I'm not going to give you your money back, we were going to protect you, you're going to... Uh, you should know where to sign, and if you put your signature somewhere, then it's, your, it's a responsible thing, and you cannot just uh, change your mind, and uh, we would have been your family, and now you're going to end up in drugs. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> what am I going to do? And I started asking uh, friends and uh, lawyer what to do. Anyway, eventually this man came to senses. I'm sure his wife, um, uh, she interfered in the situation because I'm sure this woman had been through this kind of cases before and she felt sorry for me. So I went, he gave me back my money, and he said, it's not what you think. He just said this, and I just got my money and left out of there. And I started living in Athens. Like I, I found another great flood in a very nice old neighborhood in the center of Athens, in Thysio. Tiny, but I didn't care. I, had the, I was on the top of the building, so I could have the view of uh, Acropolis. And uh, I was part, practically living on the roof. I mean, I had my carpet there. I was reading all day. I, was, I had no TV, no, no refrigerator, no nothing. But it was great. And uh, I eventually I totally forgot why I was there. Theater was not important. I was just living, experiencing this life of being there as a local because I was amongst locals. And my accent was so good that nobody would realize unless I would use my English. Greeks are terrible with English. They, are talking, they cannot pronounce the, the heart. Um, uh, letter. So it's uh, whenever there was a need to say an English word, let's say, I was a waitress, so if I would say Stolishnaya, they were like, oh, where are you from? Anyway, fun, entertaining, but I'd also I've seen another point of view of the artist because it was a very um, posh and artistic place. My uh, three, the three. Um, People that they owned the place, the one was the owner of a gallery, the other was a director, and the other one uh, was a journalist. And uh, so they had a lot of, they knew a lot of people. So I saw from the, uh, another point of view, the actors and the artists of the city, and I wasn't very happy with what I was seeing. Uh, and I was observing a lot. But what was the most fascinating is that I've learned like, you know, I get one thing and I go to the other and I go to the other and this becomes more and more interesting. I'm, I'm meeting things and my life is evolving. At a point I started feeling boring, bored and um, there was this man that was coming almost every day in the place. He was, um, um, he, he's German. And uh, he was selling some of his uh, crafts. He said he was a street artist, and he had uh, developed his own technique of painting uh, old LPs, making them into clocks. So he was coming, and uh, I was uh, um, I was empathizing him. I was offering him something to. It was obvious that he had no money, so I was like giving him coffee or something to eat. And he kept coming and coming and we were talking. And he kept, at the point he started asking me out. And I was a bit negative in the beginning. I wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't, I was negative. And he kept asking and I was saying no. And he kept asking and I was saying no. And he kept coming and coming. And I started feeling flattered at the point. And I started feeling fasc fascinated about his way of life also. He, he seemed so free. Uh, so one night I had decided that, okay, when he comes, I'm going to say yes. And he came and he said, shall we go for a drink after we finish? And I said, okay, let's go for a drink. And we went out in the streets of Athens and uh, we were together after that. He practically moved into my place. And uh, very fast, I decided that I would give up my job and that uh, I would follow him. 
he offered that. I told him that I was quite bored of this kind of life. Anyway, so he said, don't worry, we, we, my way of life seems very low budget, but we can manage, we can keep your flat, blah, blah, blah. Nothing of all this worked, but uh, I started living differently. I mean, uh, he was living, actually, he was living in a yard outside Athens. A friend of him has given him this um, uh, small house that wasn't actually a house. It's like um, Leomeno. It's like a metal house that they have, something like that, yeah, like for holidays, that uh, his friend that, Comfort. yeah, gave him this place so he could stay. And eventually we moved there. But what we were doing is like, we were um, going out, selling his stuff, either with a shop on the street, like putting a um, piece of cloth on the street, displaying all his lovely, um, clocks, his paintings he was doing, and people would just come and pick. But it was the period that the Olympics were about to happen in Athens, and the authorities were cleaning the town. They wanted all these kind of people to leave. So it was more and more difficult. We were selling this stuff into cafeterias, like going around and showing what we were doing. And he was trying to promote me into this because it was more uh, beneficial, you know, a girl to go and do this and a man alone. And uh, when Athens became kind of dangerous for this, we started going outside. We would jump in a train with no money. We, we would know at which point they would, uh, the authorities would check, they would stop us. And then uh, from there we would go out and uh, hitchhike. And uh, yes. He's a brother of Elena and they have something to do in the space for 10 minutes and I don't know what it is but he's really angry and shouting, he's like, coming now and so I don't... Yes, we, um, I mean, I was, uh, we, yeah, we were getting in a train and we knew exactly what to do, everything was planned. I mean, we would know when the guys would, when somebody would come and check for tickets and we would knew up to which point the train would stop. So we would get out and get into, um, on the highways most of the time to get out of Athens and hitchhike. And of course, again, I would go first because it's different seeing a tall man alone hitchhiking than seeing, I would, I would go first. The, the, guy, the cars would stop because they would see a small girl hitchhiking and then my boyfriend would show up. <laughs> Some people would, uh, they were, there were people that they would uh, say, no, we cannot take you both. Or there were people that they were cool with that. And this, the hitchhiking for me was the most fascinating things of all. It was fantastic because I always had this dream. All this experience was a dream coming true in one way. And um, I felt very safe because my boyfriend was living like that for years and years. So he had developed a plan to survive into these situations. And um, he knew how to manage with people. And he knew how to manage with this. So at no point I felt any fear that I was in danger. He was protecting me. And uh, we were just moving and he had an idea about where we would go, where we would find people, where there would be cafeterias to sell his stuff. And um, we were acting based on how it was going, based on what we would sell. We would either stay somewhere or we would either have something more expensive to eat or something less expensive to eat. We would either rent a, a room in a motel, a hotel or somewhere, or either we would practically sleep outside. 
we would always we were carrying um, uh, backpacks, and we had all the things we needed in there. And uh, the, we made, for me, huge distances. We almost reached uh, Thessaloniki with this kind of uh, uh, trips, hi with hitchhiking. We would just go out for three or four days up to the point where we would take it, and then we would go back to the house, which was mostly a yard, but it was summer, so it was okay. And uh, we would just stay there and uh, relax for a while and uh, get new material and make new stuff. And after that, again, go out and make money. Uh, the most uh, interesting thing of all this for me was um, traveling with big trucks. I was fantastic because you, they are huge and you have this amazing view. And they, we were going in several uh, times on um, roads next to the sea or into the nature to cover big distances, and I, would, I was thrilled by this. This was the very nice, happy part of, uh, of the whole story. On the other hand, my boyfriend was very um, suspicious with people. His way of life made him be very reserved. Uh, and as I was discovering him, I discovered that he had a story of going away of his responsibilities. He had a family before Germany. He had uh, uh, he had his own story from which he escaped that led him into this kind of life, traveling and living and working and living and going somewhere else and then living. And this made him very suspicious and negative about life and people because he was living on the... Um, um, he had an underground life. Uh, and this started to interfere with me because from the beginning he didn't want us to use phone. So. I had to call my parents from the first days and tell them, listen, um, I've fallen in love and then I'm going to close my phone. <laughs> and my parents freaked out. And of course, this uh, eventually uh, created a distance with my friends and the people of my life. Because for me, I wasn't taking that very seriously at that point, but people that I was away from, they didn't know what was happening. I mean, am I being abused? Is somebody forcing me to do something I don't want? What is the thing with no communication? And uh, we always had to <coughs> lie about who we were and what we were doing when we were meeting into people with people, into when we were getting into other people's cars. I was not allowed to say where I was from and what was I doing. We always had fake stories about ourselves. He wanted to keep this, I don't know, he, secrets about who we were. And I remember oh, uh, one night we were traveling uh, with a big truck and my boyfriend had fallen asleep and the driver started talking to me. And I, I was talking to him, he was like, People were curious about us. And my boyfriend would wake up and he would like, you know, stop, don't, don't give details, don't say more things about us. Um, and this attitude uh, started making me feel awkward. But was me, was, was, uh, what started telling me inside, hey, you're, uh, um, losing the control of your life or you're losing your actual life was that um, I was drifted away from everything that I knew about myself. I had no contact with my family, no contact with my friends. I had no relationship with theater anymore. So I, I felt like if this is going to go on, I have to establish a new identity for myself. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to 
be this other person that keeps living on the street or uh, in a yard or... And also, all the things that my boyfriend said that they would... Uh, that it was, we would make it financially, that he would be able to support him, me, all this started to change. And he started to feeling the responsibility of another person. Because before he was on his own, he would manage on his own, he had no problem no matter how things would come. But we, having another person, his girlfriend with him, that was stressing him. So he started getting in depression and things uh, in Athens and in the era were kind of dodgy. It wasn't easy to make that money, after all, not enough money for two people. Even though we were really living on low budgets, like pasta, the whole, <laughs> I mean, basic food. And uh, I had the need also to come back to Cyprus to rejoin with my life, with myself, with my family. So we had decided that uh, after uh, we were traveling like that for three, four months, that um, I would come back in Cyprus for vacations for a while, until also he gets some time to reorganize himself and reorganize our way of living. And I would have time, he wouldn't have my responsibility, I would have time to rest and be with my family and see how it would go. So we collected money for my ticket, I come to Cyprus and he is in Athens. And um, I get on the plane with, uh, not suitcase, I was carrying, I put all my stuff, I folded them in a piece, in a um, shield we use for the bed. And I was holding it like that on my back. And everybody was looking at me in the train because I had no suitcases, I had only this. But I wasn't feeling uncomfortable. I felt so released. I was like, I can do whatever I want, I'm free. I mean, I don't care. What do you think of me? I was totally looking like a gypsy girl. And I remember I was telling in this procedure that I'm, I'm Roma, I'm something like that. I had these images as a, as a child that I was a gypsy, I was always fascinated by these kind of stories. Anyway, I come back to Cyprus, my parents, they come and pick me up from the airport and they are in shock. Total shock. I mean, my parents are quite open people, but they are like ordinary people from the village. I mean... My dad is a musician, he's quite open-minded, but again, up to a limit, I mean. So when my mom sees me with this uh, shield with my stuff inside and uh, my skin dry from the sun because we were uh, walking around a lot and I lost so much weight and I totally uh, neglecting my looks. I mean, I didn't care, I had hair all over my body and of course, no makeup, my hair were growing wild. And uh, they didn't say anything in the beginning, they were, but they were in shock. But they were trying to take me back and understand uh, what was happening to me. Anyway, after a few days, uh, my boyfriend was not feeling well. He was worse and worse in his de de depression. So I've decided that I had to take over. And I said, listen, I mean, if we want to be together, you should come here. This is my place. I know how to deal with things. I'll find a job. I'll find a flat. And you come here. And we see how we take it from here. And that's what we did. I got a job. I got my uh, old job, one of the waitressing jobs I had before I leave. I found a new flat in the same building I was living before. And I started making money. So I sent him the money for the ticket and he comes with my cut, thank God, that I had taken with me before. And uh, here in Cyprus, uh, we discovered, I mean, I discovered that um, I, I couldn't accept this man here. He was totally out, he, he couldn't fit. 
anywhere. And he also felt he couldn't fit. He was, because in Cyprus, uh, this kind of life that does not exist, there are no people living outside or uh, street performance. This doesn't exist in Cyprus. Uh, whereas in, in Europe, this is common. Um, so he couldn't find anything to do. He couldn't do what he knew here in Cyprus. He couldn't find the materials. And he started nagging and complaining and whinging and being more and more negative. And uh, he just spent the whole day in the house in front of the television. And when I would come back from work, he would complain how terrible the world is and how politicians are uh, planning for everything and there is a plan and there will be a war and uh, we are being controlled. And I, I started feeling oppressed by a negative uh, atmosphere that was not giving me any chance to breathe. I could understand his fears from one hand. On the other hand, I wasn't experienced enough to realize that this man was in a um, very deep depression state. All I was feeling is that I, I couldn't breathe anymore. And uh, I would fix things in the house and then I would go back and he would just put the things in the simple way so we couldn't we wouldn't need to clean and we had this huge house but we were only living in the living room with the, the mattress on the floor and uh, then he started being possessive and he had issues that I was going out and uh, if I was talking to other men and if I would look beautiful he would just be jealous and I just couldn't put him back into my life but I was happy that I was back, that I was, I, I had again the control of my life and uh, yeah. And I started feeling sick. Um, but I'm, what I forgot to mention is that I wasn't very experienced in relationships. So I didn't see, I didn't see it coming. But I started feeling very, very oppressive and he was more and more paranoid. So I asked, started, before I decided to break up, I started asking him to go back to where it all started. I was pushing him to go back to Germany and sort all the things with his family out so he could start, because he had guilt that they were haunting him. And I, I really believed that if he would go back and face his past and he was also missing his family, he would just find his balance again. And he kept saying, I'm gonna leave tomorrow, I'm gonna leave tomorrow, I'm gonna leave tomorrow. And finally he made some contact with his family and they agreed to get him a ticket so that he would go back to Germany. Uh, but uh, at the end he, I don't know, he, he didn't want it to, he couldn't face that. But I couldn't wait any longer, so at the winter time, I remember it was, it was raining, and I said, you know, enough is enough, you have to go. I mean, not tomorrow, not uh, the next week, I don't care what you're going to do, I can't take it anymore, I mean, you have to go. And uh, because I was, I mean, I wasn't... I, I couldn't face it, but I wasn't feeling well. I started fainting and uh, my body was telling me like, this is not good for me anymore. And my mind was telling me, no, I mean, this is the love of my life. I have to stay with him. I have to stick to him because that's what couples do. But anyway, so I did say eventually, you know, get your stuff, leave. Now, leave now. And that's what he did. He took his things in his backpack and he left. And then I was, uh, I was uh, desperate because I changed my mind afterwards and it was winter and there was rain and I started feeling sad about him that he was somewhere in the streets with uh, no blankets and no food and blah, blah, blah. And I even called the police and they were making fun of me, like, what do you want us to do? You broke up. What do you want us to do? I mean, 
we cannot help you. I, went, I even went to the airport. I was looking to see if he left with the flag, everything. Anyway, eventually I started, I recovered from all this and I started to remember I was painting flowers all over my house. I needed to have a hope again, uh, feel like life is, it can't be nice also, I mean, it doesn't have to be so black. And um, this man showed up after a year. I mean, he was calling me, meanwhile, from time to time. He even asked me to marry him. He said I was the best thing ever happened to his life. He was in Germany. He was in a, in a place for homeless people for a while, where he was calling from. And I was like, no, I mean, this is over. Don't come back here. Find your own way in life. I'm, I've moved on. It's done. And after a year, around five o'clock in the morning, I, a friend of mine from Greece, that she knew him also, that I met her in Greece, she came, she was looking for a job and she came in Cyprus and we were sharing the flat. And the door knocks around five o'clock. We were up, we were working night time, so we finished our job and we were in the flat and I hear somebody in the door and I go look from the little hole on the door and it's him. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it had been a year. And I let him in and uh, he, he made, apparently he made a journey from Germany, he went to Turkey, from Turkey he went on the other side in Cyprus and from the other side he came back. And he was begging me to be back together again, but I was, I mean, I wasn't fascinated by that anymore. All these things seemed uh, um, uh, a way of uh, escaping life and responsibilities. And uh, from what I was seeing in front of me, this was not a happy, a nice way to live. And uh, yeah, that was the last time I saw him. And then I was, I, I heard from friends because I moved from that place, but then he was going back and knocking doors. And I heard that he was somewhere in Lima eating fruits from the trees in the street. And yeah, never seen him again. And yeah.